All right, guys, time now for our weekly partnership segment with The Lever. Joining us for the first time this week, we have Adam Lowenstein. He has written, written a great piece for The Lever. He also writes Reframe Your Inbox, which is an email newsletter of essays and interviews about corporate power, capitalism, and politics. Definitely sounds like something I would be into. Great to see you, Adam. Welcome. Good to see you, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and put up this piece that you wrote um, for The Lever, which I think is really interesting and very relevant about BlackRock. Um, you say here, for BlackRock, the climate crisis is a win, win, win. No matter how or whether governments tackle climate change, the world's biggest asset manager has positioned itself to cash in. So just break down here for us your reporting. Absolutely. So let's start with the first win, which is the status quo. And we know right now BlackRock is investing a ton of money in oil, gas, and coal and other dirty assets and industries and technologies by their own calculations. They're making money off some $260 billion worth of fossil fuel investments. That's as, as of last summer. So that could have increased since then. Um, but BlackRock is also making a ton of money off sustainable investments by their own calculations. They manage more than $500 billion worth of assets and investment products that have been deemed or marketed as sustainable and environmentally friendly. So these are two big cash cows for BlackRock, and that's just the status quo. The second win, you know, if governments do decide to take more meaningful action on climate change, because of all of the rhetoric and all of the PR that BlackRock has done, you know, Larry Fink's annual letters are always a hot topic in the business world. And he makes these big sweeping claims about how BlackRock is going to be tackling climate change and that because governments have failed, businesses need to step in and step up neglecting to mention, of course, that some of the reasons that governments have been unable to tackle global challenges like climate change is because of really effective business lobbying against solutions. But even having said that, if governments do take more meaningful action, BlackRock has been so effective at positioning itself as a responsible and serious and good faith actor in the climate discussion that when the negotiating table is set up, BlackRock is probably going to have a seat at it. And what that means is that BlackRock might be advocating for solutions to climate change that benefit the company and as well as society, but BlackRock is never going to sign off on any solution that is good for society, but bad for the company, which right off the bat limits the number of possible solutions to the, the small number that are good for companies like BlackRock. And then the third win is that because of all this talk and this PR and all this rhetoric about you know, being a good faith actor and taking climate change seriously and working together, um, BlackRock is already winning. No matter what governments do or don't do, the company has secured a reputation as this effective climate partner, which means that all of the money from sustainable and ESG investments, which are growing you know, astronomically, a lot of that's going to keep flowing to BlackRock. So Adam, at the heart of this is ESG, which you mentioned. Explain that a little bit to the audience and why it's a scam. Sure. So ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance. Um, and it's often you hear it in the context of ESG investing. Although ESG, you know, like a lot of acronyms, has kind of just come to symbolize everything about businesses taking meaningful action to save the world, basically. And you have seen, by some estimates, there's $35 trillion of assets that are labeled ESG. Um, you know, some estimates say that this could grow up to $50 trillion in the next few years. And basically what ESG investing says is that you can use your money and you can make money and you can also save the world at the same time. And a lot of times there's, well, there's a few problems with it. Number one, there's no real standardization for what ESG means. And there's an announcement from the SEC a few weeks ago that um, they're going to start rolling out some proposed climate disclosure rules, which actually might start to standardize what some of these ESG labels mean. But for the most part, what it means is that different asset managers and institutional investors like BlackRock can offer products that they claim are good for society, good for human rights, good for diversity and inclusion, good for the climate, um, and basically imply to investors, which could be individual investors, it could be pension funds, it could be other companies. Basically, what they're saying is that you put your money into these ESG funds and you don't really need to do anything else because your money is going to make the world a better place. And that's a very seductive idea. It's very comforting. It would be nice if we could just let companies and capitalism solve you know, the world's problems for us. But because there is this implied and sometimes very explicit claim that ESG investments will also be better for the bottom line than traditional investments, then 
once again, similar to BlackRock saying, you know, we're going to be at the table and so we're going to rule out all the solutions that aren't good for our business. If you have an ESG product that maybe is good for society, but isn't making as much money as a traditional mutual fund, which could be invested in all sorts of companies like Exxon and um, Chevron and, you know, all, you know, Facebook and all of these companies that, you know, you could make a pretty compelling argument are not good for society. If these ESG funds don't make as much money as the other ones, then they're just not going to gain traction. And so on top of that, you have a lot of ESG funds that are just labeled environmental or sustainable or green, and they're full of stocks like Exxon Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and Chevron oil and gas companies. And we've seen this a lot over the last six weeks or so following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You have a lot of ESG funds that hold shares in Russian companies, including Russian oil and gas. Um, What are, based on what we know BlackRock's holdings, what are some of the climate solutions that they might find acceptable? Like, okay, we're going to make money off of that one. And what do you think are some of the things they would push out of the bounds of conversation? Yeah, so in the piece, I talk about this uh, speech that Larry Fink gave at Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, um, gave at the G20 last summer um, in Italy. And he outlined a few of the solutions that he wants to see. One of those is that he wants to see more scrutiny for state run and privately held companies. There's a lot of scrutiny for publicly traded companies about what they're doing on the environment or what they're not doing, what they're doing on human rights or what they're not doing. And Larry Fink wants to see more scrutiny for privately held companies and for state run companies, which is legit. There are a lot of public companies that are offloading dirty assets to private companies. They're just selling them um, or to state run companies. And that doesn't, as Larry Fink himself has said, that doesn't actually make the world any greener or more sustainable. It just shifts who holds Mm -hmm. those assets to less, Mm -hmm. um, you know, heavily scrutinized entities. But it's also a very convenient argument for BlackRock because if you have less scrutiny on public companies like BlackRock and more scrutiny on other firms, well, that means less scrutiny for BlackRock. It's right there in the statement. Mm -hmm. Um, But what it also hides is the fact that BlackRock itself, while calling for more scrutiny for privately held and state-run companies, BlackRock is continuing to partner with and invest in privately held and state-run companies. Um, They just announced a big investment coalition with a bunch of investors who invested in a $15 billion uh, pipeline project with Saudi Aramco, Um, you know, obviously, you know, a a massive company and a state run company out of Saudi Arabia. BlackRock, I mentioned a couple of places in the piece. Um, BlackRock is investing in pipelines in Texas with privately held energy and infrastructure companies. So that's, that's one argument that they make where there's some truth to it, but it's also a very convenient argument for the company. Um, Another Another solution that um, BlackRock would like to see is governments investing trillions and trillions of dollars in lowering what Larry Fink calls the green premium. The fact that a lot of green industries and technologies and products are more expensive than traditional ones, non-green ones. And again, there's a kernel of truth to that. There is definitely a role to play for governments to help spark the initial upfront investment. there's a lot of private capital is not necessarily going to move into these spaces without governments bearing some of the upfront risk. But once again, this is a very, very convenient argument for BlackRock to make because as Larry Fink has said, you know, there's a long-term investment possibility of $50 trillion worth of green investments. And that's a pretty lucrative pot of money for the world's biggest long-term investor, BlackRock, to be eyeing. Right. So, Yes, yeah, so we yeah. see how these all roads lead to good for BlackRock. And since they get to have exactly. such a critical voice in shaping what even the solutions might look like, that very much constrains the possibilities of yeah. how governments act. Um, I think it's a really important piece. I really urge people to take a look at it. And it's great to talk, you, talk with you this morning, Adam. Great to meet you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure. And thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day. We'll have more for you later. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.